nuts and bolts, the brass tacks. What yeah. is a fixed blade knife? Yeah. A fixed blade knife is a knife that doesn't fold. So it's a knife. You, you, you almost don't need to even define it. You need to define what a folder is instead. A folder right. is a knife that folds, but this is just a regular yeah. knife. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from the KnifeJunkie.com. we got a great show for you coming up today. We've got our couple of segments, our main show topic, and, of course, our pocket check to yep. uh, start the show. But, Bob, kind of give us a preview of what our main show topic is going to be today. What are we going to talk about? Well, today we're going to continue with our Knife 101, and we're going to talk about fixed blade knives, primarily camp knives, combat knives, and neck knives. Oh, okay. A lot of, uh, lot of topic there to unfold. It oh, like, yes. It's you know, like thousands of years worth of history. Oh, okay. We'll cram all that into about 15 minutes, so <laughs> maybe we'll talk fast. Uh, a couple of uh, show segments that we always have. We've got uh, Knife Life News coming up. An American knife manufacturer made a recent announcement that has... Perhaps some significance on the company and the, mm-hmm. their uh, future in the, the knife industry. So we'll talk about that in the Knife Life News segment. And our tip of the week segment is going to be fixed blade lanyards, which ties into our main topic, which is fixed blade knives. But first, Bob, we've got to have our pocket check. And oh, yes. We'll, we'll check your pocket because I think our listeners know what's in mine. <laughs> well, I'll tell you all, if you, if you don't know, Jim is carrying the vaunted Victorinox Tinker. Awesome blade. He uses it all the time. I do. Today, I'm pulling out a knife I hardly ever use, but I carry like jewelry. It's my uh, uh, Spyderco CPM 20 CV and carbon fiber Yojimbo 2. An amazing knife. It's it's like half, uh, half matte knife, half uh, self-defense knife. Hmm. Pretty incredible. And then I also have my... Uh, my single-bladed GEC spear point number 15 with the yellow antique bone that I love so much. And I think last time you had the GEC 14 in your pocket. That's right, yeah. with the same bone covers. Exactly, exactly. And then, as always, my pink broken skull with the snaggle tooth, which I'll be doing a review on real soon. Yeah, okay, interesting. I like the uh, I like the pink one, by the way, too. I yeah. like the I like the the GEC one as well. But yeah, little cognitive dissonance with the pink. You look at it, doesn't <laughs> doesn't look so nasty. Right, right. It's not a it's not, it's not manly, but it is manly. Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right. Enough of the pocket check. We've got a great show for you coming up. Fixed Blades, as well as Knife Life News, and our tip of the week all to come on the Knife Junkie podcast. Before we get into this week's show, here's the Knife Junkie with this week's Knife Life News. Today I'll be reading a press release from the Benchmade website from November 5th. It says, on November 5th, 2018, Benchmade announced that John Diasis, son of our founder and CEO Les Diasis, is assuming the role of president. John Diasis grew up with the Benchmade brand, spending his life learning the family business and preparing himself through various roles within and outside of the company. John has spent the last three years as vice president of operations, overseeing the brand's production and rapid growth in Oregon City. During his tenure, Benchmade has continued to upgrade and strengthen its manufacturing and service capacity in order to provide the highest level of service to all customers. Now, this is his father. He's the founder, talking about his son. I am humbled and overjoyed to have John move into his role and feel that this is a great step forward for the organization. The company and family at Benchmade have been my life's work since we opened our doors in 1987. Nothing means more to me than the passion, quality, commitment, and energy each and every member of our team has dedicated to building the best knives in the world. I know that John is the right choice to help continue that drive well into the future and bring Benchmade to a generation of new customers. Okay, okay. So, so so Benchmade is a family-owned company. Then. Yes, it is. And okay. and John DSS has moved into the role that his father has always held since the company right, began. Right. And I think that this has some significance mm-hmm. because over the last five years or so, I've been hearing a lot about Benchmade's quality control. Uh, and it being lacking oh, for okay. such a premium American brand. You're putting down premium bucks for these knives, oh. and they're very, very uh, held in very high regard. But they were showing up with lock rock, with blade wiggle, hmm. with um, all sorts of problems, uncentered blades, and people felt you know they shouldn't be receiving this for, sure, for their premium sure, dollar. Absolutely. 
But over the last three years or so, it seems like they've been cleaning up their act with quality control. I've mm. been hearing, uh, I'm not a huge Benchmade consumer, but this past uh, two years, I've gotten three models and they've all been perfect. Mm. And uh, so I think it's true what other people are saying. They're, they're starting to continue, they're starting to uh, improve their quality control. And okay. I think it must have been when John Deasis, the son, mm-hmm. became the director, or the, I'm sorry, the vice president of operations. Okay. He started whipping them back into shit. Gotcha. Now, was you he- know, Younger guy watching more YouTube, maybe, than right. his father. <laughs> right. Now, was he with the company before that? Well, I only know that he worked there for a while, and he also worked outside of the company. Oh, and I, okay. I only know that from their own press okay, release. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So I guess uh, maybe went away for a little bit and then came back to kind of yeah. in the fold in the family. and you know, Classic kind of Abrahamic thing. story. Yeah. Anything else about this uh, this news here with uh, with Benchmade and the, the change at the helm? Anything, just personal opinion or thoughts looking forward? One of the things that has held me back from buying many of the Benchmade designs that come out that really talk to me has been this quality control thing. I don't ordinarily, I don't, I don't have 200 bucks to throw around all the time. Right. And when I do, I want to make sure that it's something, sure. you know, I'm not going to have. Now, they've always had an amazing warranty service. So if there's a problem, you send it back, they fix it for free. But I think that this will, will be good for the, the future products. Right. Because right. if you're going to spend money on a knife, you want to make sure it's good quality and you won't have any issues. But again, as you said, they stand behind their knives and uh, you can return them for free and get them fixed. 100%. Or whatever, whatever. Yeah. So. Okay, so that's uh, it for the Knife Life News. Stay tuned. We've got a great segment on uh, fixed blade knives coming up and then our tip of the week, fixed blade lanyards, still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim and Bob here with you. Our main show segment, we're going to be talking about fixed blade knives on this week's show, That's right, Bob. Jim. Fixed blade knives. Well, it's it's such a huge topic. Yeah, looking at some of these <laughs> knives, they're huge on this table here, yeah. But I figured we'd approach it from a Knife 101 kind of standpoint. Okay. Um, the way I break, um, uh, break it down in my mind is that Fixed blade knives, those that are readily available to you and I through retailers brick and mortar or retailers online, mm-hmm. fall generally into three categories. Okay. Um, you have your combat knives, you have your camp oriented knives. Okay. And then you have your EDC blades. Uh, EDC fixed blades generally tend to be neck knives worn around the neck, or sometimes they're kept in the pocket in small little slip sheets. Right. Now, EDC. I've learned this term yes. as a knife newbie, but yes. it was one of the first ter- terms I learned, everyday carry. Right. And now everyday carry usually means something that's small and discreet and something that you can manage small tasks with on okay. a daily basis. Okay. Just throw it in your pocket and forget about it. Okay. Uh, and we generally don't tend to think of fixed blade knives in the EDC because of the kind of society we live in. Most of oh, us live right, these suburban right. lives or urban lives. And, and though legally acceptable, it's kind of socially un- unacceptable to walk around with a Bowie knife. Right. <laughs> and, and, right. <laughs> right. So in the state we live, Jim, it is absolutely positively legal for you to take this nine inch Western Bowie knife, put it on your belt, and go to the grocery store. Really? Yep. Or the post office. Or, well, maybe not the post office. Right. And not the bank either, but most public places. Wow. But you could not take that same knife and hide it on your person or uh, even in your car uh, if you're sitting close to it. And, uh, and be legal. Because that's a concealed weapon at that point. Exactly. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, we might have to dive into that in a future show with one of our segments that we uh, call Knife Laws. Most definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we will have to cover yeah. it. But so just nuts and bolts, the brass tacks. What yeah. is a fixed blade knife? Yeah. A fixed blade knife is a knife that doesn't fold. So it's a knife. You, you you almost don't need to even define it. You need to define what a folder is instead. A folder right. is a knife that folds, but this is just a regular yeah. knife. Yeah. Uh, generally worn on the belt in a sheath or on some sort of uh, load-bearing equipment in a sheath. And the main benefit to these knives are quick accessibility mm-hmm. and positive strength through the center of the blade. Okay, explain expl- that again. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you have a folding knife, right, where the knife pivots time, in the right. handle, that's your that's your point of weakness. Mm. That or the or the blade uh, locking mechanism. That's your point of weakness. And if you were to take it and um, you know jam it in a cliff and try and pull yourself up with it, it right. would probably fail right there at right. the at the pivot. But if you have a fixed blade knife and you do the same thing, you have a plank of metal basically that you're pulling yourself up on. Gotcha. That's a that's a vast generalization. Sure, sure. Lots of different styles just in the few that you have here on the table, you know, long, thick, or more ornate, more simple, uh, different handles as well, the little, little guards on the end of the handle, et cetera. Yeah. 
Well, okay, so let's start with um, let's start with your camp knife. Okay, yeah. Now, a camp knife. These are two classics. For those listening, you you might know what this is. It's a Mora classic craftsman. It's made in Sweden. Okay. It's a little wooden handled craft knife. Okay, and it's got a uh, it's light. It is extremely light, and it has a Scandinavian grind, a Scandi grind. That's where, on the edge bevel, uh, the edge bevel starts far up the blade, and it terminates in one edge, as opposed to two edges, hmm. like a normal blade. Mm-hmm. And you get great cutting performance out of that. You also get splitting performance out of that. But you can um, you can carve real fine wood splinters and shavings to make fires. And uh, this is a called a Hudson Bay Camp Knife. This is an old pattern from uh, the settlers of the the New World, and uh, these were used uh, especially up in Canada. Mm-hmm. But it's it's basically like a large uh, Bowie camp knife. It's yeah, used yeah. for everything from cleaning game to chopping wood at the campfire or kindling, I should say, at the campfire. And uh, you can pull this out and fight someone with it if you right, need to. It's, it's an intimidating yes. kind of yeah. pointy, cleavery kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. But these these knives accelerate in tasks that require wood cutting, mm. that require um, things that you would do sh- while you're camping. Shavings, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay. okay, camping or or making traps, right. this kind of thing. Okay. So how does a camp knife differentiate from a combat knife since they're both fixed blade? There isn't as much of a differentiation as you would think because a combat knife made for soldiers has to be first and foremost a great utility knife. Mm. Because they're going to be using it uh, to open up crates. They're going to be using it to open up packages and, you know, um, their food food right, packages. Right. You know, they're going to be using it for utility most often. Mm-hmm. I mean, most soldiers do not ever press their, their combat knives into actual combat. That's what their rifles and their pistols are for and such. Mm. Here, here's a combat knife. This is the classic mm-hmm. American uh, United States Marine Corps K-Bar knife. Okay. It's got a stacked leather handle. These are leather discs that are stacked and compressed and then carved with a heavy butt cap that can be used. This pommel can be oh, used yeah. for hammering. Or a weapon. Stakes or a weapon, most certainly. Uh, it has a Bowie-shaped blade. This is a uh, clip-point blade, like a classic Bowie. This is sharp on the back, this little this little portion here. Hmm. That's a combat aspect of this oh, knife. Okay. Right. Use it to the side if you had to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But on the whole, this thing is used for utility. All right. You know, you could press any sort of edged thing sure. into into a weapon, but a but a combat knife is kind of half weapon, half camp tool. Right, right. So then uh, we've got the camp and the combat, and then uh, the EDC or everyday carry. But I think when earlier when we were talking, you also called it a neck knife. Yes, yes. Now this is a neck knife of my own making, and uh, it's small. It's got a three inch blade and a two inch handle. And it hangs on this paracord around my okay, like a land, like a lanyard. Exactly. And then you know when you need it, you just tug oh, on just it. It's it there in your hand. Yeah. Okay. And you can just put it back. Now, one of the one of the most celebrated neck knives in their relatively short history. They only really hit the scene in the late nineties, I think, hmm. or so, maybe even two thousand. Is this one? It's the Columbia River Knife and Tool Minimalist, and it's this tiny little knife. I keep it on the back of the lanyard uh, for my work ID, and yeah. it kind of hangs behind my work ID. I no one even notices. Really notice it, yeah. yeah. So it's a it's a knife right in view. This one, by the way, I will do a long term review on because I've been carrying this for right. years there. And what do you use that one for mainly? Uh, sharpening pencils. You can see the the lead mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. the side. This yeah. is a great knife for sharpening pencils. But I open up other boxes with other knives in them that come to the office. I'll okay. use this to open it up. Oh, okay. You know, embarrassed to say. Right. <laughs> But I need to, I need to mention, I said camp, combat, and EDC, but there's something missing. Okay. Fighting knives. Oh. People like to pretend they don't exist. People like to pretend that you don't use knives as weapons, but they most certainly can be pressed into that. Um, well, and, and in earlier days, olden days, they did, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. You know, the ubiquity of the gun, I guess, uh, reduced that a bit, but you're going to have to be pretty quick with that gun if there's someone right up on top of you with mm-hmm. a knife, so... Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of knives that are really bent towards mayhem and combat. Okay. Uh, not combat, but fighting. Right, right. Okay. Um, this one is a classic. I think this came from the riverboat, uh, Mississippi riverboat culture, gambling culture, in the earlier part of this country. Mm-hmm. It's called a push dagger. Right. And, it, well, this is a modernized version of it with modern materials, but mm-hmm. it's got sharp on both sides. It's mm-hmm. three and a half inches long. It tucks away, and once you grip that in your fist, and with the blade protruding from between your fingers, mm-hmm. it's very, very hard to disarm you. All right. It's like a little handle. Yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. And you can punch with it and you can do all sorts of nasty yeah, stuff with it. Yeah. And I guess gamblers used to keep it in the cummerbund of their, of their tuxedos oh, and yeah. just kind of whip it out if they needed to. Huh. But like all things in knife history, this can be traced back to the Indian katar, a big battle weapon that had a gauntlet mm. and then a, a blade or a few blades right. protruding from it. Oh, it, was wow. a, it was a melee weapon. You know, 500 years later, you see it in, in a uh, riverboat mm-hmm. in Mississippi in a small package. Okay. Now, there are certain types of these camp, combat, uh, EDC or neck knives that we're talking about and fighting knives. One category, when we're talking about collectability, more collectible than others, or they just kind of all fit into this fixed blade knife category that is collectible in itself? Well, from from my perspective, I find the combat and um, fighting knives mm. more interesting to collect because that's where my area of interest lies. Mm. But I think just from what I've gathered uh, temperature on YouTube, I think a lot of guys who do camp, who do a lot of camping and outdoor mm. bushcraft, which I find fascinating, but it doesn't, I've never been much of an outdoorsman. Right. It doesn't really work into right. my lifestyle right nor now. Nor I, nor I. But I love to watch guys on YouTube, you know, carving wood and stuff. And it seems that people who really are into camping love collecting great outdoors knives. Mm. Um, things like these Moras and um, Essies and, you know, other knives that mm-hmm. that can be... Um, I guess it just kind of depends on your personal taste. Like you said, you know, yeah. you're not, not much on the outdoors, so you aren't gravitated toward that. But with your martial arts background and some of those things you're doing, you're more interested into the fighting and combat knives. So it's really, I guess, personal preference. Yeah. And there's not like a lack of knives in any of these categories that we're talking about. Right. But you were mentioning specifically collectability and, and knowing you, you're you're thinking about yeah, resale. Right. And, I am. And, and I would me. say uh, maybe looking into older combat and Bowie knives like Randall knives, mm. uh, Randall made knives. Um, they're handmade in Florida. He started making these knives for, for GIs in World War One, and they still make them today, some for the outdoors, some for fighting, mm-hmm. you know, combat style. Uh, they're beautiful. They're very collectible. Mm-hmm. So I would say probably more so than camp knives, right. combat knives. Right. Now, I noticed a lot of the fixed blade knives that you brought with us today, except for the uh, the, the combat knife you showed me there, um, very, I, I was going to say plain, mm-hmm. not a lot of... Uh, Ornate, lot of not a lot of covers or handles that we talked about last week with the uh, the folding knives with those uh, yeah the traditional knives yeah so is that just some of the examples that you brought or are there some of those other kind of uh, like covers or different handles and more ornate and those kind of things with fixed blades right I think with fixed blades you'll find endless variety mm. but a lot of those I just can't afford there is a great company gotcha. um, called uh, Bark River Knives out of Escanaba Michigan. And uh, they create beautiful knives, camp knives, handmade in the in a big factory. Mm. And uh, whenever they release a new knife, they release it like the traditional companies do, where they you can buy this knife with ten different handle materials. It's really cool. You can buy the same knife with in either carta or all these different kinds of woods, right. uh, sometimes stag handles, mm. um, and that really increases the value and collectability. Gotcha. Because okay. if you're really hooked on a certain design variation on that design is what a collector goes for, I think. Right, right. Well, then you mentioned you could carry these knives legally in most areas, most states. Check your local laws again. We're not giving you legal guidance here. Put it in a sheath or a pocket carrier, that type of thing, as opposed to the you know, the pocket knives or folding knives that we've talked about in our Knife 101 series, you know, so far early on on the, the Knife Chunky podcast. For me personally, just looking at the ones that we've covered so far, I think I'm more of the the grandpa knife, you know, the the folder kind of knife kind of guy. Yeah. Well, most people are. Yeah. And and in your day to day life, it's it it might be a better you know right. It might work out better for you just because it's legal doesn't mean it's going to be socially. You should be. Yeah. Should well, do it right. You don't want to be a pariah. Oh, that's the guy who walks around with a knife, with a giant knife. Right. But some people do it, and uh, I'm sure it works fine for them. They're not all knives, like in our jurisdiction, are legal. This one uh, would be legal if it didn't have the back edge completely sharp. You see that? Uh-uh, right. This is based on a famous knife maker, Bob Loveless. He created this sub-hilt fighter. This is the sub-hilt. It allows you to, once it's jammed in between someone's ribs... Oh, you've got the little allow- extra little tab there. Yeah. to For grip, you can pull it back out. Hmm. So the uh, being uh, not legal is because of the two-sided blade makes it more of a weapon, I guess, as opposed to utilitarian. 
you know, air quotes kind of thing. Exactly. And, and it assumes that the, that the user has any idea how to, how to actually wield a double edged blade in a, in mm-hmm. a weapon type fashion. Right. It takes training and. Right. But in any case, it, to me, that's an arbitrary and ridiculous law. But right. They never asked me. Right. They didn't ask the knife junkie, but, uh, you can ask him or you can call and give us an opinion, whatever you want to do. Call the, uh, knife junkie listener line, 724-466-4487. That's 724-466-4487. Before we wrap up this talk about Knife 101, I want to talk about another uh, fixed blade knife that um, has uh, left its mark on history. Now, Bob, also. that was not on the table. I did not see this one coming out of... <laughs> <laughs> this is a dr- this that is, is a dr- not a knife. <laughs> no, no. This is a dramatic statement piece. <laughs> yes. Now, this, is a gift. this was a gift from my brother who has given me some of my craziest, coolest knives. This is called a Cold Steel Chaos. And it's a kukri. So the reason I brought this is to to show you. I mean, this it doesn't get any more fighting knife than this. Look, and that's still called a knife, even though it's what is that? Eighteen, twenty four inches long. It yeah, looks like a that's, sword. To that's me. a twelve inch. It's kind of a. I, I want to talk about the knife itself in a okay. second. But this, as a fighting knife, you got a skull cap breaker here, whatever this is. You have a D guard knuckle knuckle buster for. It's based on the World War One trench knives. But they put a kukri blade on it. Now, what's a kukri blade? It's a traditional Nepalese um, blade used by the, their special soldiers called the kukris. I'm, I'm sorry, called the Gurkhas. Those were the soldiers. And this blade was created to have disproportionate cutting power to the length. So you have a relatively short blade, but this deep curve and this giant belly makes it twice as efficient in chopping because I don't need to move my wrist. By the time I hit my target, the blade has already been there. Hmm. I'm I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Bob always pulls out a surprise on me. I wasn't wasn't anticipating that when he had it hidden back behind his little table over there. <laughs> so that's the when the electric uh, when the electricity goes out. That's the one I reach for. <laughs> and why is that? The zombies are coming. Yeah, just in case. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Fixed blade knives. Uh, wrap it up. What do we need to know? What do we need to remember as we're kind of continuing our Knife 101 with fixed blades today? I'd say if you want to pick up a fixed blade knife for camp or whatever else, go to uh, go to your local retailer. Buy a cheap one first. See what you like about it. But then I would say it's worth, depending on where you live, you might have knife shops. We don't have knife shops around us. Depending on where you live, go online. Find a good knife with, with some good steel, 1095 or some other higher grade stainless steel than you'll get at Walmart and buy it. And it'll last you forever. Mm-hmm. Like this cold steel tanto that I've had since 1987. Wow. Well, if you happen to be looking for a new fixed blade knife and you found the content we've provided valuable, uh, we certainly would appreciate you going to amazon.thenifejunkie.com or eBay, the knife junkie, uh, dot the knife junkie.com and do your shopping there. We'll receive a small little commission. It's not going to uh, increase the price that you pay any, but it does help uh, provide support to the show for us to uh, pay for our hosting fees and all those uh, kind of other things. So, again, Amazon.TheKnifeJunkie.com or eBay.TheKnifeJunkie.com. You're listening to The Knife Junkie Podcast, and now it's time for this week's Tip of the Week. Some days I'm a lanyard guy. Some days I'm not. On any given day, you may or may not find a lanyard or a paracord fob on the slip joint, modern folder, or fixed blade I'm carrying. I put them on, I cut them off. I put them on with a new cool knot, I cut it off. But my backyard knives are different. My backyard knives are what I use to keep the sprawling suburban estate pruned and tidy. Think a veritable hydra of English ivy, Virginia creeper, and grapevine that seems to grow faster when I cut. In the summer, you can note the viney advance by the day. It's creepy. To do battle against such a force of nature, it is imperative my backyard knives always keep their lanyards. On my hip, when mowing, trimming, and maintaining, is the exceptionally tough Topps Tex Creek. In swing rolls are my Vaquero Grande for cutting in tight spots, and a vintage Ontario standard-issue machete for whatever isn't cooperating. All three of these knives see a lot of cutting and chopping of vines, tree limbs, tall grass, and everything else. Each one of them is extremely sharp, so in no instance can I afford to let one of these blades leave my hand. I've seen what a S.E. hungless can do to a lower leg. So the lanyard stays, and it gets used. Every time. But not how you might think. I do not loop the lanyard over my wrist, because if I lose my grip on the knife, I still have a sharp knife dangling freely and it will tend to swing out and in towards me, out and in, 
which if you maintain your blades correctly, is very dangerous. So what I do, I think I first heard of this from Ray Mears, the acclaimed bush crafter, uh, I give the lanyard a length long enough to loop it over my thumb, and then gird the back of my hand snugly while squeezing the knife handle in hammer grip. With the lanyard deployed in such a fashion, it gives you a sureness of grip while allowing you to choke back on the end of the handle and swing and chop with an enhanced leverage. And here's the safety part. If you lose your grip on the knife, because it's suspended over the back of your hand, it will swing side to side in front of you, instead of forward and back, into you. This way it will not cut you. It's less likely to cut you. So take it from me, who took it from an expert. Try this lanyard trick. You may find the tension of the lanyard across the back of your hand is reassuring and aids in finer control. Or maybe you won't. Give this lanyard trick a try and let us know. Great info on this week's Tip of the Week. And now back to the Knife Junkie Podcast. All right, well, that looks like it's going to do it for the uh, Knife Junkie Podcast this week. Jim, what do you think? Fixed blade knives? Well, I, I, I think fixed blade knives are interesting, but not as interesting for me as the uh, the pocket folders and the and the grandpa knives. And, that and why thing. was that? I guess I like the aesthetics, the look. You know, I you know the the jigging, the the bone handle, the stag handles, which maybe you know come with some fixed blades, but I uh, also like the uh, the size as well. You know, the some of the the pocket folders obviously can fit in your pocket right, and are right. able to carry a little more. And for me, more utilitarian. But as you mentioned during the show, you know, I'm. I'm thinking collectability and sellability. That's true. That's <laughs> true for the side hustles. It's realistic. Yeah. But if you ever want to project menace, I I yeah, recommend it. Absolutely. Well, I also wanted to compliment you on that tip of the week. I mean, that was that was that was pretty cool stuff. You know, oh, just a, a simple thing about how to you know take that lanyard and affix it to your hand so you're not going to stab yourself and get hurt. I mean, yes. Yeah, that's yes. some pretty good information. I, it's uh, something I've seen, and some people have adopted it, and and it really works for me. So yeah. I hope other people yeah. try it out. Yeah. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the uh, Knife Junkie podcast. Please visit the uh, website, thenifejunkie.com. Catch us on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube, as well as on Instagram. And join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. Uh, the Knife Junkie, Bob DeMarco, final thoughts for you on uh, fixed blades as we're uh, continuing with our Knife 101 series. Well, with your fixed blades, you're likely to find a lot of high carbon steel. So just make sure you take good care of it. Keep a coat of oil on it, and uh, and it'll take care of you for a long time. Right. And you can go back and listen to some uh, previous episodes for uh, Maintenance Minute and uh, see how to take care of those blades. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.